This is the US Air Force F-117 Nighthawk, the first stealth attack aircraft ever put into service, so you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear the black jet was officially retired in 2008. Wait, can I call it that? So, how did the Nighthawk go from being an iconic symbol of laser-guided stealth firepower to the Air Force mistress that they publicly won't acknowledge? However, over the last few years, the Nighthawk has been the subject of tons of military analyst speculation and all-around brouhaha, because it's seemingly returned from the dead. Why, after all these years, is the military potentially still deploying a decades-old platform in combat in the Middle East? Lock on to that like and subscribe button and let's find out. It's 1975, and we're in the offices of Lockheed's famous Skunk Works Division, which is basically where the US Air Force does all of its top secret engineering. This is where they created a software program called Echo One. Echo One had the goal to use computers to calculate designs and geometric shapes that would result in the absolute smallest radar signature possible. The result? The famously unique delta wing design. What delta wing design means is that the wings are shaped like a triangle with the leading edge forming the base and the trailing edge forming the two equal sides. Delta wings have this swept back appearance so they're angled backwards from the fuselage. Honestly not sure what the big deal is, I've been designing those since I was a child. This was actually first seen much earlier in Lockheed's proof of concept aircraft called Havblu. The maiden flight of the Havblu was in June of 1978 over Area 51. Worry not, this was back when Area 51 security was secure, long before anyone dreamed of storming the base to clap them alien cheeks. The Havblu's first flight was deemed a success because its radar cross section wasn't able to be targeted by pursuing friendly F-15 fighters during test runs. The way it accomplished this was due to that delta wing design, dispersing the electromagnetic energy laterally as opposed to directly back at the air radar scans. For those of us who struggled to pass the military's entrance exam, that basically means the radar signature was too small to recognize as an actual aircraft. Stealth aircraft technology had been accomplished. And now, Ridge Wallet makes their very own line of leather daddy pants, so your slim wallet can fit in your skin-tight pants. Uh, what do you mean that's not real? Well, can we ask Ridge if they'll partner on that idea? Picking out gifts for your loved ones is stressful. It gives me existential dread that I cope with by going outside at night alone and staring at the stars while wondering, what's the point of it all? Then I remember, the point of life is to get a beautifully crafted Ridge Wallet that comes in 30 plus colors and styles. You can even personalize them with text and designs to let people know you care. I get it, you're having trouble letting go of your old leather wallet. That's why they created a leather version of their wallet. Shop the holiday sale by going to ridge.com slash task and purpose and get up to 30% off through December 20th. If you use my link, you can even enter your email or phone number for a free chance to win a Ridge bundle worth $4,000 without spending a thing. So click the link in the description or head over to ridge.com slash task and purpose to get in on a holiday savings. Once the top dogs in the Air Force brass were satisfied with Havblu's performance, the design was scaled up slightly in order to increase payload capacity for strike missions. There was an increase in funding at this point. The military basically just chucked money at the project that was allocated towards the production of an operational stealth aircraft, the Lockheed F-117. Work was done under the program codenamed Senior Trend. Note to self, start a clothing brand for old people named Senior Trend. After a small number of airframe modifications to increase stability, production of the first batch of F-117s began here at Lockheed Vega factory in Burbank, California, under a mountain of top secret classifications. Seeing as this was the first attempt at stealth aircraft in history for an operational aircraft, before even the legendary B-2 bomber, the Pentagon ensured that no knowledge of this new development would risk falling into the wrong hands. Hate when it falls into the wrong hands. Initial tests of prototypes and test aircraft revealed that despite the Nighthawk's ability to stay off of a radar, the delta wing design and harsh geometry made it aerodynamically poor and unstable in flight. This spurred the Air Force to secretly establish a dedicated Nighthawk squadron before the first planes were even off the production line, under then Colonel Sandy Sharp, who would lead the formation. After the first test flights of the F-117 were conducted, Colonel Sharp demanded two changes to the airframe, 
enlarge the tail fins to decrease wobbling, and to paint it black, as he believed it would allow for better visual concealment at night. That, and in the words of Alan Brown, the Skunk Works project manager for the Nighthawk, <clears throat> real men don't fly funny pastel aeroplanes. That's probably not at all like how he sounded, and I'm certain he could have kicked my ass. The final design that resulted after initial testing was increased to a wingspan of 43 feet, with the entire fuselage being 65 feet long, weighing roughly 52,500 pounds dry. As both speed and agility were low on the priority list of requirements, twin GE F404 turbofan engines were used. These delivered a combined thrust of 21,200 pounds. This non-afterburning engine could only bring the Nighthawk up to a max speed of about Mach 0.9, or just below the speed of sound. This of course was not an issue, seeing as afterburners create massive heat signatures and the sonic boom from supersonic flight would probably be a good indication that there's a military jet in the area. The engines were encased within the fuselage and dispersed the heat of the exhaust over a wider area using distinct slit exhaust ports while enabling it to mix with cooler air before leaving the aircraft. These twin slit exhausts were virtually invisible to most infrared trackers at the time. The Nighthawk could carry a payload of two air-to-ground munitions, which might seem like a you know, limited payload, but that's up to 5,000 pounds of boom boom in a stealth aircraft, which is insane. That means two munitions, each weighing 2,000 pounds, could fit in there. Those laser-guided bombs could hit targets within a combat radius of about 590 miles. Tyler Rajaway, who runs the war zone, explains the purpose of the black jet best. It was created to carry and employ nuclear gravity bombs, namely the B-57 and B-61, that are shown front and center in this image. The aircraft's cockpit included an aircraft monitoring and control panel that interfaced with the permissive action link on the nuclear weapons. That allowed them to be armed and programmed prior to delivery. Because I know I can only speak for myself, but personally, I hate having to program my nuclear bombs at the last minute. It's like, can't we just program this on the ride over there? So remember, this thing comes out in the early 1980s, and if you're the Soviet Union seeing this, it would have been a heck of a lot of scary, because it was designed to silently sneak in and drop a big one, giving new meaning to the term silent but deadly. Sorry, that was dumb, I'm dumb. Roger Way from the war zone said, quote, even the angle at which the F-117 presented itself to known threatening emitters was part of the computerized planning process that aimed to give the F-117 pilot the best shot at surviving based on all known factors. Here's an old advertisement from Lockheed Sanders that pointed out this planning aspect. It says, quote, people who know mission planning plan on Sanders. That's some Don Draper sh right there. That's some Sterling Cooper gold level advertising. If this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, hopefully I can go write lines like that for the military industrial complex. Despite its F designation, the Nighthawk is not a fighter and likewise has no built-in guns for dogfighting. It was designed for a very specific role to hit high value and high payoff targets with precision ammunition. All of this in compromised airspace while at night. So that was the reasoning for having a limited capacity of just two bombs. In order to maintain a solid geometry while flying, the aircraft would have to rely on internal weapons bays as opposed to external hardpoints like your traditional aircraft. This naturally requires plenty of space within the total fuselage in order to work. Generally speaking, the bigger something is, the bigger the radar signature. I know straight up dropping wisdom bombs on you right now. After the initial increase in size, it was determined by the Air Force that any additional surface area would create a dangerously large radar cross-section on the plane, meaning additional bombs couldn't be carried. Targeting for these bombs was achieved in a very unique way with onboard infrared cameras that were nested within the belly of the aircraft, which would be used by the pilot in order to actively guide rounds all the way up to impact. Unlike most planes, it did not contain a radar for scanning or navigation, relying instead on an accurate inertial navigation unit, or INU, which detected the angle and speed over time of the aircraft, which was then displayed on a digital map overlay inside the cockpit instead of a traditional GPS. 
This is actually a huge capability because many bombers require you to have a separate spotter on the ground to laze the target, which means you need special forces behind enemy lines with laser designators inserted close to the target, which is risky. I can relate to the Nighthawk because as an introvert, I don't wanna coordinate my fire with anyone but me. Famous for its instability, the Nighthawk is controlled by a quadruple redundant fly-by-wire system derived from the F-16 program. Most aspects of the Nighthawk's avionics were also cannibalized from other aircraft, both as a cheap way to use proven aircraft components and to keep overall development a secret. These parts were actually initially ordered under the guise of quote-unquote spare parts for other aircraft. This type of top secret accounting is probably why you hear rumors about $10,000 hammers being purchased at Skunk Works to hide their secret project's costs. While the physical design of the Nighthawk did most of the work enabling radar stealth, the outside of the fuselage was also covered in a mixture of radar absorbent material with a layered composite structure. The combination of these efforts led to a radar cross-section, or basically what that means is how large it shows up when it's detected by radar, of just one thousandth of a meter squared, or about the size of a marble, or a really, really small soccer ball. Effectively invisible to enemy air defense networks is all we need to know. The DoD wanted the Nighthawk operational as soon as possible, but due to the difficulties that come with combining complex, large-scale manufacturing with heavy secrecy, these aircraft were slow to reach the tarmac, with only a four to six built per year during the entire 1980s, and a total of 59 would eventually be delivered for operational service, with the first batch in full operational service in 1983. Even after the Nighthawk entered service, it would be a full six years until the Air Force admitted the aircraft even existed. The F-117 was designed with the Cold War in mind. During Operation Desert Storm, Iraq's capital was considered to be the most densely defended airspace, with anti-air emplacements covering every square inch of sky above the city. The Nighthawk was able to engage over 1,000 ground targets using laser-guided bombs with minimal collateral damage or civilian casualties and suffering no losses of aircraft whatsoever, despite a 5% expected loss rate. This was a nearly inconceivable idea at the time, and the Nighthawk left Desert Storm one of, if not the most formidable weapon in the Air Force's arsenal at the time. It wasn't until 1999 that it would see action again, though it was an unexpected result. NATO began a bombing run against Yugoslavian targets with the goal of opening up airspace from enemy air defenses. Lieutenant Colonel Dale Zelko was shot down by Serbian SA-3 anti-aircraft missiles. This was a remarkable feat, as the crew of the batteries were operating outdated and unreliable Soviet-era radars with Chinese export missiles. The shock of losing what was seen as an invincible plane led by the American Air Force rewrote the doctrine on stealth, as well as the realization that with the downed aircraft came the fact that its top secret stealth capabilities would fall into the hands of any near-peer adversary. It required intensive planning, intelligence gathering, and an emphasis on unpredictability. Considering that classified documents on the Nighthawk were recently leaked on the War Thunder forums regarding attack angles and location of sensors, we should be safe for the time being from any data leaks that would put actual lives at risk. The Nighthawk's final confirmed operational use was seen in a more limited number during the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. All signs were pointing towards the F-117's retirement. This is where the story of the Nighthawk's unconventional retirement begins. Instead of scrapping the airframes, the Air Force placed all remaining F-117s into Type 1000 storage, this being a loose assembly of parts stored in tightly monitored climate-controlled environments. Strangely enough, just two years after their supposed mothballing, eyewitnesses began reporting sights of flying Nighthawks over the Nevada test and training range out of Nellis Air Force Base. That includes Area 51. And theories of what exactly the Air Force was doing with these planes began to get interesting. In September of 2016, two F-17s were spotted flying training sorties with apparent fuselage modifications. In 2021, the Air National Guard admitted that they were actively using these planes to simulate cruise missiles. So the F-117s were being used as surrogates for cruise missiles this is because cruise missiles usually fly low to the ground and have a small radar cross-section and low infrared thermal signature. What that means is they're tough to spot. Nighthawks are allegedly used as mock cruise missiles for Air Force training, as sort of like stand-ins for the missiles. 
This then helps aid in the research and development for new sensors. It was then in 2017 that a Dutch aviation magazine reported that anonymous but reliable sources claimed that at least four F-17s were deployed to the Middle East as an operational need emerged for the United States Air Force to resurrect the Stealth Nighthawk for special purposes. At this point, the only place that stealth would be directly required as a capability would be in Syria, where Russian and Syrian air defenses were in full force, scanning for American aircraft. But why would the US Air Force, with its fleet of F-22 and B-2 bombers, need to secretly deploy an outdated first-generation aircraft to a risky and politically sensitive conflict in Syria? The war zone's Tyler Rodgerway provides the best possible explanation that would make sense for this theory. In short, it boils down to the payload that the F-117 was originally designed to carry, that being two Mark 48 2,000-pound laser-guided bombs. These munitions are actively guided by the pilot rather than GPS like the JDAM. The biggest benefit for a laser-guided bomb is that unlike JDAMs, they can hit a moving target, a high-profile target in a moving vehicle perhaps. According to Tyler Rodgerway, with the retirement of the F-117, the United States Air Force gave up the ability to drop laser-guided bombs from a stealthy platform that was capable of designating its own targets. While the B-2 is very capable of delivering these types of payloads, there's only a handful of them in service, and deployment of them to the Middle East would not only be astronomically expensive, but because they're our highest level strategic bomber, would raise all kinds of alarms that the United States was planning intensive operations within the region. The F-22, on the other hand, while more widely available and capable of evading detection, lacks the capacity of laser-guided munitions. The F-117 historically navigated with its own inertial guidance system and almost always at night, meaning Russian GPS jamming, which was prevalent in the area, would have no effect on the aircraft's ability to navigate to and from the target. Finally, the Nighthawk was just old, and its stealth properties were well known by adversarial militaries at this point. If an aircraft were to be lost and not recovered, there'd be no loss in modern stealth technology to an adversary. While the idea of these planes in combat is still just a rumor started by the Dutch, what we do know is that between 2008 and 2019, despite numerous congressional laws requiring it, not a single F-117 was dismantled. Since then, more and more of the aircraft have been seen with increasing frequency. This coincided with an order by the Air Force clearing the F-117 for aerial refueling by the KC-135 aircraft and forward deployments to Myanmar and supporting U.S. carrier groups off the coast of California. Finally, in January of 2022, along the Saline Military Operations Area, an F-117 was spotted during low-altitude maneuvers alongside an F-35 both sporting a chrome finish. This chrome finish has yet to be acknowledged by the Air Force, but it's likely testing material for future aircraft coatings. The F-117 is like that awesome substitute history teacher that shows up out of nowhere every once in a while, pops on a great movie like Saving Private Ryan, and asks for nothing in return. Someone by the name of at Stinkjet on Instagram even captured images of the Nighthawk flying a low altitude pass through the upper Mojave Desert region of California in 2023. Oh cool, Stinkjet was my squad's old nickname for me. It ripped through what's called the R-2508 complex and Sidewinder Low Flying Route, where the US Air Force top pilots train. It's over 450 kilometers across, with 13 alphabetical waypoints where the F-117 is permitted to fly as low as 200 feet above the ground. It was developed to standardize low flying tactics for jets, in order to avoid anti-air systems and so they could get close enough to the target to shoot them, and it was also made for that dope scene in Top Gun 2. With all of its recent resurgence in operational use showing up on everyone's radar again, or maybe I should say not showing up on everyone's radar, is there a chance that the Nighthawk would actually be a viable platform in 2023 against a near-peer military like China? Unfortunately for retro aviation enthusiasts, uh, not likely. So the Nighthawk was designed to defeat older monostatic radars by reflecting the signature away from itself. Now, with the rise of passive bistatic or multistatic radars, those deflected signatures would be detected by adjacent systems. Secondly, while the F-22 and B-2 couldn't truly replace the capabilities of the F-117, the F-35 can, and outpaces the Nighthawk in every category 
China especially has made serious strides in its deployment of stealth detection technology, which operate on lower band frequencies that the Nighthawk would specifically be detected on. But the PLA's go-to air defense system, the JY-14, would unfortunately for the Nighthawk easily pick it up and allow for quick targeting. Combine this with the slow speed of the aircraft and lack of defensive capabilities, these aircraft would go from mothball to fireball very quickly. The Air Force openly published a request for future F-117 maintenance and logistics support services. Services. At this point, the F-117 is joining the ranks of other legacy Air Force projects that seemingly will be living forever, albeit way cooler looking than the B-52. Thank you guys for watching. Hit the like button if you liked the video. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and I'll see you guys again soon.